Good to see everybody this morning. And uh, today, uh, the 25th of August, so it's our uh, birth date for the church, 25-year anniversary. Um, we have uh, a cake next door for in between. Hopefully, gets cut and put out. So, um, but uh, also the anniversary books are over there. Um, and so forth, and look through the pictures. I, I just looked through them, and was like, wow, I was young looking. <laughs> and a little, and then you see people that, you know, are, are gone with the Lord, and then you see folks who forsaken the doctrine and left, and then you see folks who just left. So, anyway, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, if you will. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And uh, we're going to go back into this section here, uh, really verse 6, But I speak this by permission and not of commandment, for I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I, but if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn." And under the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband. And we won't get into verse 10. Really, verse 6, 7, 8, and 9 here, because of what Paul is doing here now. And in, in the first five verses, it's pretty straightforward. Here's the rules, okay? When it comes to the issue of verse 2, nevertheless to avoid fornication, Here's the rules, here's the guidelines, here's the boundaries, uh, the, the sexual immor the, the immorality issue of fornication is not, how do we answer that? How do we avoid that? Well, we go get married. And we understand that the, what, where in marriage is where the sexual activity is to, is to be maintained and, taking, and, 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 and uh, carried out. That thing in verse 3 about do benevolence and ownership and this proper identity, I, uh, proper understanding about where uh, sex was intended to be carried out. Now, in starting in verse 6, but I speak this by permission and not of commandment. And this is going to be kind of what we're going to begin to see here is the, 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 uh, the routine within the chapter. And, and, and the order within the chapter, and really the order moving out through the rest of the book of 1 Corinthians, in that he's, Paul, I speak by permission. Paul, as our pattern now, is going to manifest, he's going to put on display, he's going to demonstrate his understanding of the doctrine in light of the situation that he's in, and then we're going to see how he's going to apply the doctrines learned to that situation, to his life, in his case, ministry. Okay, So what we're going to see now is not a command, but rather a perspective. And it's, a, it's very instructive here in verse 6, 7, 8, and 9. Now, by the way, verse 10, Paul says, and under the married, I command, yet not I, but the Lord. And he literally now interjects himself. It is very interesting. Under the married, I command. Why didn't he just say the Lord command? Why does he say, I command, yet not I, but the Lord? See, there's some instructiveness there, instruction, some insight there because of who Paul is as the apostle of the Gentiles and the due time testifier. So this information isn't, this information, really, this whole chapter is the information given to the Apostle Paul by the, by the Lord Jesus Christ through special revelation, then given to the body of Christ. Because when we get to talking about divorce and remarriage, it's going it, to, I said it a, the last couple of weeks, I actually got an email from a, from a lady of, of, yeah, what you just said, you know, just really killed what I learned for 50 years in the, in the church she went to. And, you know, once married, always married, and do this, do that, and blah, blah, blah. And that's not the case. And Paul is, so when, we, when he says, verse 6, but I speak this by permission, here's his viewpoint. 
Here's his opinion, and it sits in the eternal word of God. See, it's not just an addendum that you can say yes or no. No, here is the word of God. I, I, it's just, it, just kind of chilling to me that here's the Lord, the Holy Spirit, inspiration, writing the word, using the, the, uh, the, the human agent, Paul, and Paul says, well, you know, here's kind of what I think about it. And he starts writing that down. And the Holy Spirit says, uh, that's good. I like that. Let's leave that. And it's like, well, because Paul's demonstrating the grace of God. He's demonstrating not a command, not a thou shalt not. But rather, hey, here's some flexibility. Here's, here, here, here's, a, here's a, vo- a viable option. It isn't so cut and dry that it's black and white. It's, hey, your situation may require you to think about this a little different than my situation requires me to think about. And literally, to the believer today, here's, some, here's a tremendous disp- de- demonstration of God's grace. And again, Paul's going to demonstrate the application of doctrines learned. And I say that like that because of the end of Romans 16 there, because you don't know all the doctrine. I don't know all the doctrine. But the doctrine that I do know is where I need to be living in and walking in. So it's sound doctrine, yes, but it's also doctrines learned. So here's how we're going to apply the doctrines learned to the situations of life, the situations you find yourself in. And again, we too, Paul's going to do it, but we too have a privilege as adult sons in the family, as adults in the family of God, to look at our situation and then apply the doctrines learned to those situations. And again, it's going to look different how you think about, how Paul's going to think about this, how you would think about it is going to be different than how I think about it. But what are we applying? The same doctrine. You may apply it differently because you're in a different condition, situation. I apply the same doctrine to my situation, and I'm, I'm in a different situation. See, And as we go through, I hope you see this. And, and really, that, the point that this morning is to notice that there, are some fle- there is some flexibility in this. And this is going to be the real key, really, to the remainder of the chapter because if you don't have the flexibility and you don't understand that there is sometimes a viable option now you become a mandate now you become a law now you become legalistic see and what does that do well when the law shows up grace sits down romans 11:6 if it's works it's no more grace if it's grace it's no more works Figure it out. Which one? See, so when you think about this, again, by permission, verse 6. I speak this by permission and not of commandment. This is not a mandate. Now compare that to verse 10. And unto the married, I command, yet not I. But this is a command. Verse 12. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. And so, so in verse 10 and 11, here's the situation, bam. And in verse 12, okay, that's the, that's the doctrine. Now let's go apply that. And when we get over here, we've got some flexibility. You see how he's going to do that. So 7, 6, here's some flexibility. Here's a way to view it. Here's a way to apply. Verse 7, for I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after his, his this manner and another after that. Paul's going to describe where he's at here and what he's chosen to do. By the way, he's chosen not to be married. That's what he's chosen to do. Verse 8, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. So what is Paul? He's unmarried. Now, whether he was never married and a single guy or was married, gets saved on the road to Damascus and she dumps him, 
divorce. Or he's a, wit- she's, he's a widower. It doesn't matter his condition. See, Paul, Paul is either a widow or a single guy. He never says his marital status was. He just says, I'm what? I'm unmarried. He never says any of that. Why? Because his status isn't the issue. The issue is the choice that he's making in the situation in front of him. He's, he's, <laughs> he's looked at, he looks at the situation, and he's found himself in the unmarried group. And he's willingly choosing to stay there, not to go get remarried. By the way, verse 9, but, and if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is buried to marry, then to burn. Obviously, he's not anti-married, marriage. By the way, a lot of Paul's critics today use this passage to say that Paul hated marriage. They use verse 8. Actually, they use verse 7 and 8, but they say, hey, it's good for them to be a... See, I'm unmarried, so don't you get married. And they preach against marriage using that. Paul's not anti-marriage. He's, he has decided, he finds himself in the unmarried group, so he's decided to stay unmarried. He's decided to stay single. As Paul looks at his situation, at his life, at his ministry, who is he? He's the apostle. I mean, think about what kind of a married life that would be, to be married to the apostle and him gone all the time. And then his poor wife hears about the beatings, the persecutions. What kind of a... He, so he says, what? I'm not going to do that to a prospective wife. I'm going to stay single. I'm going to stay unmarried. You see, there's an option here. It doesn't say, I got to get married, or I got to stay. There's options on the table. He's looked at a situation, and then through the right application of the doctrines learned, here's what is best, and it's best that I stay unmarried. Well, see how that's going to work, how that works here. So if you find yourself unmarried, whether single, all your days, divorced, widowed, or widower, perhaps it's better to choose to remain unmarried. I told you last week, Linda and I, she told me, when I die, you got to get married again. I'm like, why? Do I have to? Because you will never function on your own without without a wife. I'm like, well, I tell you what, you just get my ties on the jackets right and we'll be fine, you know? I don't know. (laughs) I'm like, so what are you telling me? You're leaving me here? What's the deal? <laughs> You're dying on me or what? You know. But that's the thing. Why? Because for some, to be unmarried is a death sentence. Mel Derry, he's with the Lord now. He was an eternal bachelor. Came back from World War II and so forth and Korea and just never got married and enjoyed himself. He just never, it wasn't that he didn't have younger ladies or little old ladies chasing him as he got older, because they were, but he just, it just wasn't for him, see. And he, so if you find yourself that way, you got a choice. That's the point here. And again, verse 9, if you can't contain, it's better to get married. So you have to look at your situation, and that's what Paul's going to get at. Now, with the Corinthians, what is their situation? They're over here in a fornication, see. They're they're not functioning properly. They're not thinking properly. They're going after the wisdom of the world and human viewpoint and just doing what they want to do. And Paul's, he's rebuking them. He's He's corrective doctrine, and he's rebuking them, trying to bring them in. So as you and I look at it, at this passage, I'm not, I don't look around the room and go, oh, there's people doing this. You, know, I, you look at this and say, hang on a minute. How's the right application of the doctrines learned here? And, and hopefully that's what we take from it. Because, again, when you look at your situation... Sometimes you make a decision that, you know what, maybe it's good that I get married or that I don't get married. 
I, and it's okay. There's no mandate. See, there's no law. And again, verse 9, Paul's not against marriage, even though people say that he is, and he really isn't. And we'll see that here as we go down. He's simply looking at the present situation, and by permission, 7-6, he's expressing his application of the doctrines learned to his life, to his ministry, not a command, not a mandate, none of that. It's, hey, I looked at my situation, and for me, it's best not to have to worry about a wife at home while I'm out doing ministry, okay? So I'm going to just stay single. Why does Paul talk like this in verse 7, 8, and 9? Well, come down to verse 25. And when we get into these verses in a couple weeks, we're going to pick them apart and go through them. But notice why he says why he's presenting these viable options now concerning virgins i have no commandment of the lord yet i give my judgment as one that have obtained mercy of the lord to be faithful now again virgins that's never been married no sexual activity not okay pure purity again what does he say i give my judgment I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for a man so to be. Be what? A virgin. Don't be married. See, here's, I, I suppose, see that verse 26? I suppose, here's my thinking on this. Here's the application. You've got to appreciate Paul's language here. As we're going to work, and again, we'll work through what the present distress is, but notice, when it comes to the virgin, it's good for them to be what? To stay a virgin. Don't get over messed up and all because of what's presently going on there at Corinth. So here's a real viable option to remain single. And that's a good, I, I love that. And it's good for a man, so to be. So when you come back to chapter, verse 7, the reason that Paul is saying what he's saying now, going to say here as we look through these three verses, 7, 8, 9, 6, 7, 8, 9, is because Paul's looking at the present distress. He sees what's happening at Corinth. He sees what's happening in his own life. And he says, okay, let's make some decisions here and let's do it appropriately. So verse 7, for I would that all men were even as I myself. Here's Paul's thinking. Here's his reasoning. Here's him. All right, let's, let's work through the options here. But every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. Now, that part of that verse, the, the proper gift of God, gets blown up, gets taken out, yanked over here, and he says, wait a second, and how it gets used is, is to say, God gives a gift of celibacy, and therefore, if he gave you the gift of celibacy, then you can't get married again. By the way, that's not what Paul's talking about at all. <laughs> you see, he's talking about staying unmarried. What's his, even as, my, even as I myself, what is he? Verse 8, he's unmarried, see. So they use these verses, to, and they actually they use the proper gift of God as a weapon. They use it on the young people. Instead of teaching the young, the teenagers, and you know, we understand what, how teenagers are. You were one, one time, okay. Instead of teaching them the proper issues and, and doctrine about marriage and 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 keeping yourself for your future spouse. They don't do that. They come over here with the, this mentality of beating purity into them, beating celibacy into them, because it's the gift of God. And they misuse this. And again, Paul says, I speak by permission, not by commandment. So there wouldn't be a command here. 
So the question that comes up is, does God supernaturally give the gift of celibacy? By the way, the answer is no. But here's some verses. Again, we've got to be careful because we bring to the table things that we've been taught in the past that are going to rub up against the world. Friday night, we were in Tucson, and we're going through chapter 6, verse by verse. We got two verses the other night. And when you come to the Word of God, this is the facts. This is the doctrine. Whether you like it or not, it doesn't matter. This isn't about making you happy or making you sad. This is the truth. There is no, there's no black and white. This is the truth. No gray. This is black and white. Okay, so if you don't like it and you don't like what I'm going to say, what we're going to look at here, that's your problem. See, because this is what God's Word says. It says it clearly. Look at verse 37. So you have to be careful with this stuff. Because Paul's not, he's not saying that God supernaturally gives the gift of celibacy. If he says that and then he writes verse 37, he's a liar. Nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his what? What do you do with your heart? That's the mentality. You believe. That's the mentality of your soul. Having no necessity, but hath power over his own will, and hath so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin, doeth well. See that own will? So if God supernaturally gives the gift of celibacy, what did he just do to the, to the will of man? He just overrode it. And God never has done that. Never, ever. If he, had, if he was in that business, he would have did it with Adam in the garden, and we'd have never been in the condition we're in. See, See you have to be... You got some problematic stuff that pops up here to say that God supernaturally imparts the gift of celibacy. Where, where Paul clearly, verse 7 says, you got your own heart, you got your own will. And if you, if you think this through, verse 37, and you decide to keep the virgin, then you've done what? You doeth well. So you, you, if, you, if you, you, you work through this and you decide that, you know what, I'm going to stay celibate, virgin, is that an option to stay single, to stay celibate, to stay a virgin? Yeah. But it's a choice of your own individual will, your volition, the first institution of creation. So God never violates the free will of his crea creation. You know, he didn't even do that with the angels. The angels that have sinned. Luke says, that angelic host up there, when they heard the rebellion from, when they saw the rebellion of Lucifer and they heard his I will plan, they chose to sin. Some did, some didn't. What did, what did man do? When Adam saw Eve take that grape and eat that grape, he could have instantly claimed Numbers 30 and viol voided the vow by saying, Lord, we need you to come down here and fix the situation here, quick. But he didn't. He saw something he wanted, and ba-boom. You see, God never overrides the free will, the volition of man. He says, here's the choice. Now, think. Now go back to seven, verse 7. By the way, if it's a gift of God, supernaturally imposed by God on the, the, vir, the, the, the virgin, the celibacy, that would then supersede that person's own will. And God never does that. Always remember that. By the way, he never did that, all of Scripture. And I know what, I know what the theology, oh, the, the sovereign free will of God. You know, that's made up. That terminology never appears in Scripture, the idea is there, yes, 
but not this, he's got this, it's never like that. Rather, he says, hey, I suppose I could do this, or I determined with myself to do that, and there's this issue of, of what's happening. So you have to be very careful, go back to verse 7, with this. In Scripture, the gift of God is not always supernaturally imposed. Okay? The gift can, can and is used in a secondary meaning. It's not always a supernatural event. One illustration, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesi Ecclesiastes chapter 3. See if you can find that book. <laughs> All you guys on the tablets are cheating. Ecclesiastes 3, look at verse 13. Ecclesiastes 3, 13. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor, it is the gift of God. So, think about eating. 3.13. Children are the heritage of the Lord. Well, wait a minute. I can't have kids, so I don't get the heritage of the Lord because I can't have... No. The very ability, the very creative Nature of who you are to have children is a gift from God. Eating, the very fact that you can breathe the air you breathe is what? A gift of God. That's what 3.13 is saying. Look at that. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the good of all your labor, the eating and the drinking, the enjoyment of life is what? The gift of God. So if you don't enjoy your life, you don't enjoy eating and drinking and your labor, then that's not the gift. No, that is the gift of God. You've chosen to what, though? Not enjoy it. See? You see, you got to catch that. So the gift of God, God created man. He created... And the creation, it, come, come over to Acts. I know I told you one. Acts 14. I can't just do one. I'm sorry. A guy one time told me, can you just give me one verse? I'm like, no. So I gave him 20. I won't give you 20, but I'll give you a few more. Acts 14. You see, folks, the gift of God in Ecclesiastes, as well as in 1 Corinthians 7, is used in a secondary sense in that God has provided some means. He's provided, he's provided a gift. Look at Acts 14. Look at verse 16 and 17. Paul is uh, teaching here. He says, who in time past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. All right. That's uh, Genesis 11 with the Tower of Babel. That's when he does that. Now watch verse 17. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and a fruitful season, filling our hearts with food and gladness. Now think about what, he, what he, Paul just said there. He just took the enemy, the Gentile nations, and sent them on their way. But he still did what to them? Verse 17. Good. But how did he do good to them? creation. Now they can go out and they can farm the farmland and they can have and they can do. Just, see, he's not just sitting here going, you're my enemy. But the gift thing is the same way. The gift issue here, go back to First Corinthians, uh, well, uh, Matthew 19. So, Matthew 19. When you think about what he's talking about in 7-7, about celibacy, about, even as I myself, in other words, staying unmarried, I'm choosing to not have the intimate relation, the due benevolence issue by staying single, unmarried. Matthew 19, look at verse 12. 
Matthew 19, 12. By the way, we're going to come back into Matthew 19 probably next week because there's some things in Matthew 19 that the Lord says about marriage that Paul doesn't say. It's very fascinating. Anyway, 19, 12. Notice what verse 11, but he said unto them, so he talking to his disciples, verse 10, all men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there will be, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs. For the kingdom of heaven's sake, he that is able to receive it, let him receive it. A eunuch. We understand what a eunuch is. But notice the three classes that the eunuch can fall in. One, he's born that way. Now, could you imagine being that guy going, thanks, what a gift. Or he was made by people, government, whatever. There might be a medical issue that he had to be, whatever. Could you imagine going, well, great, that's a wonderful gift. Thanks, Lord. Or he just chose himself to do what? Be that way. See, you can't say this is imposed on by God supernaturally because you've got problems with, well, first of all, you've got major issues with overriding your, your volition, your choices. But come back to 1 Corinthians. Stop in 7. Well, actually, go on over to chapter 12. So when he talks about unmarried celibacy, it's not supernaturally imposed upon you. It's rather a work of their own ability, a work of their own will, which is a gift from God, by the way. Why? He made you that way. He created you that way. He created us with an ability to look at our situation and say, you know what, I'm not going to get married. I'm not going to enjoy the marriage relationship because of all of this. I'm choosing to stay here, and it's a good, he doeth well in that moment. Now, down the road, it may completely change, and it may be, you know what, I can't contain, so I better just get married. Neither are wrong. Both are viable options. So to say, by the way, I don't believe Paul's talking about celibacy being a supernatural gift. Can you tell? Okay. Otherwise, there's some major problems that come up. One is the overriding the will of the person. But really, it's also now chapter 12. Because in chapter 12, you have, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. That means when it comes to spiritual gifts, there's some ignorance. Not stupidity, but ignorance. You don't know. They don't know. They don't understand. They're trying to do something that isn't there. And again, this is where what's on that page is the Word of God. It is the final authority. Verse 4. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Who gives the gifts? The Spirit does. You don't, I have written across, if it is a gift, you do not seek it. Sorry. Every gift I've ever gotten, I never saw it. It was freely given to me. In the passage, verse 11, but all these worketh that one and the selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Isn't that interesting? But now, real quick, because if you go back up to verse 9, well, verse 8, for to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of... Do you, do you see celibacy listed in the list of gifts given? I don't. It's not there. Actually, if you draw your eye across the page to verse 28, and God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that, miracles, healings, 
helps governments divert. The last one in the list, the diversity of tongues, the speaking in tongue issues, which is what the Corinthians were polluting, is the last one. But notice what the first three gifts are. Not celibacy. Apostles, prophets, and teachers. That, those are the three major gifts of edification for the church, the body of Christ. And for the identification of, the, of God's word as it is written by the Apostle Paul to complete the canon of Scripture. Because what does a prophet do? Yea, hath God said, this is God's word. Boom. Now, verse 29. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? No, no, and no. Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? No, no, and no. Now watch verse 31. But covet earnestly the best gifts. Now what would the best gifts be? Well, how about in verse 28, the first, second, and third? Isn't that interesting? How about covet the best gifts, the gifts that belong to the issue of edifying the body and, and identifying the Word of God? You follow, see what, no celibacy. Now keep reading verse 31. And yet show I unto you a more excellent way. There's something better than the gift that's coming. Wow. Chapter 13, verse 8. Charity neither faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. What's going to happen to the gifts? They're going to stop one day. When do they stop? Well, verse 9, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. In the moment at Corinth, and the gifts are in play, the apostles, prophets, teachers, all the list, we have partial knowledge and partial understanding. But that, when that which is perfect is come, what would be perfect then? The knowledge and the prophecy. Well, again, what does prophecy say? Here's God's word. Yea, hath God said. So we're at partial, and now we're at complete, perfect. That means what's happened. When the canon of Scripture is complete, then what happens to the gift? It's gone. It stops. Keep reading. Verse 11. When I was a child... Paul's going to illustrate this. I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, what happens when you become a man? You grow up, you mature. I put away childish things. It's fascinating to me how Paul calls the gifts given childish. That's childish. See that? What do you need to be? You need to be over here in God's Word that's complete. The canon is done. And grow up. Verse 12, for, we, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know also even, uh, even also. See that? We know in part, then we will know. Why? Because right now it's partiality. We have to have the gifts to do, to function. And then one day when, I, when, the, when the word is completed, when Paul completes the canon of Scripture, that's done. We don't have this partial. Now we have this. Now we are face to face. And I know what they do. They say, well, verse 12 is the rapture. And you know, the God Almighty doesn't want you to wait until the rapture to become a mature saint in his family. He wants that for you right now. And by the way, did we read anywhere in chapter 12 or 13 about the rapture? The first time you read anything about the rapture in 1 Corinthians is chapter 15, 51 verse. See? So to say that the proper gift of God is the supernaturally imposed upon thing about celibacy is to, first of all, override your personal will, but secondly, it's to understand that it's not the best gift, because it's not, and then thirdly, it's going to eventually do what? Stop. Now, go back to seven. So, again, that, that's why I said a couple weeks ago, we're going to blow some things out of the water here. Why? Because people, we have the denominational religious baggage, and it's not what the Scripture verses are saying when you begin to read. It, it, we were at the swap meet. This was years ago. I was looking at those goofy pictures, and I remind, 
reminded myself of some of this. And we're talking to a guy, and, and he's just arguing every little, I mean, every jot and tittle he's arguing. I finally said, hey, enough. How many animals did Noah put on the boat? He goes, well, two. I go, are you sure? So we went back to Genesis, and guess what? Noah didn't put any on the boat. You know who put them on there? God did. God caused the animal to walk up there, not Noah. Noah built the boat. And by the way, there was also seven of the clean animals. And he's like, well, I never saw that before. And, and he quit arguing. And I looked at him and said, quit reading books about the Bible and go read your Bible. And he was like, okay. Well, by then, I was red and hot and every little ding was coming because it was, you know, it was one of those hour arguments that got nowhere. And that's my point here in 1 Corinthians 7. We're, there's some stuff here that you've got to think about. So if it's celibacy, spiritually ingrained, you know, imposed on you, you got trouble. Your problems. It's not in the list of the gifts given. It's not the best gift. It's going to stop. And oh, by the way, 737 says you made that decision on your own will. So Paul here to the Corinthians, again, to you and I, in light of the situation that you have you have found yourself in, you have a gift of God to determine what is the best route for you, and it's good, and it's okay, okay? You can determine for you, verse 7, the best course of action. Is it to stay unmarried? Or is it to get married? Verse 9. What's the best? If God's, by the way, if God imposed celibacy on you, then how can verse 9 be legit where you can't contain, so you better go get married? It wouldn't be legitimate. Because, if, by the way, when God heals somebody, it's a one-time event, head to toe. It's not a partiality thing. Benny Hinn and all those guys make it that way. That's so you can keep coming back and giving them your money. So, I, We had a neighbor three doors down, bless her heart. She spent more at a giving to Benny Hinn and the healing program than I'd ever seen, almost put them into bankruptcy. It actually caused her husband and their children to leave her, and she was in a wheelchair, and she would go, and she had to give X amount of money to get down front to get healed. She did. Guess where she was the last when she moved out? Still in that wheelchair. See, that's the shyster, the con. The problem is, is good, well-meaning people. She was. She loved the Lord. She's a saved woman, by, but she just wouldn't get over. God's gonna heal me. And you can't do. You can't. It's not here. Seven, seven. What do we have? I got a proper gift. Of God. One after this manner, i.e., what? I can stay unmarried, or another after this manner, I can go get married, verse 9, because I can't contain, I cannot not be married. <laughs> okay? I have to be married. You follow? See what's happening here. Even as I, verse 8, we got to go, verse 8. I say, therefore, to the unmarried, and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. That goes back up to verse 7, for I would that all men were even as I myself. He's not saying you have the spiritual gift of celibacy so you can't make a choice. Rather, he says what? You've got an option here. You have the ability, 737, in your own self-will to make the decision of the best course of action. You can choose to stay celibate or to marry. It's up to you. And again, if you think about the Apostle Paul and his situation, why, and really back it up even further, why in the world would a believer willingly choose to remain unmarried? Well, there's something going on in their life. You know, medically, I know believers who will never get married because if I do, I pass this gene down to the next and I'm not going to do that to, to uh, a kid. Okay, that's a legitimate reason not to say, hey, I don't, you know. That doesn't mean the right young lady won't walk by and it changes. 
but that's okay. Medically, sure. How about ministry-wise? Again, Paul, drug all over the world. I mean, can you imagine being married to the guy that he says, I'm headed to Spain, honey, and you're staying home. <laughs> what? I'm going to go with you. No, you can't. And then he doesn't even make it there. He ends up shipwrecked, a night and a day in the deep, beaten, thrown in jail, and all she's doing is what? Worry, 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 worry. Why? Because she loves him. They, they're married. He's like, nope, not going to do that. Ministry dictates that. I can tell you right now, I know she's not in the room, but you can ask her, if Linda thought she was going to be a preacher's wife, she'd have never married me. Why? A preacher's wife's the most un underappreciated person in the room. See? And she didn't sign on to that. I didn't sign her on to it when we got married. I didn't say, oh, by the way, we're going to be a preacher, you know. <laughs> no, it wasn't that at all. It just kind of worked into it. You see? Come down to verse 30, you're in chapter 7, verse 32. You see, he understood. Paul had an understanding of his life, his ministry, and you have an understanding of that. You know, I've heard people, I don't need a man. Okay, great, wonderful. I don't need a woman. Great, wonderful. That's fine. That, that's good. It's okay. Paul understood where he was. He understood all the traveling. He stood the prison time, the, all, the demands of ministry, and he knew that it would not be fair to have a wife. Because why? Look at verse 32. But I would have you without carefulness. What a way to say that. This isn't something you just wade in because you got an itch. You're careful about it. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. And by the way, verse 34 is the wife pleasing the husband. Now, is that a reason? Oh, yeah, it is. It's probably one of the major issues with Paul. Paul knew that if I'm married, and I'm worried about her at home, I can't focus here where I need to focus. Now, it doesn't mean that it, everybody, I couldn't do what I do without my wife. I know that. We co-labor. But I'm not out hazarding my life every day either. <laughs> okay? All right? So, when you, you, and that's really Paul's point here. Go back to 7, 8. I, therefore, to the unmarried... It is good for them if they abide even as I. You need to think your situation through. You need to look at it. You need to say, hey, you know what? It might be best right now in this moment for me not to run out there and get remarried or married. I need to stay single. Okay. But then you got verse 9. If you cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. Well, maybe the situation's changed now, and now it's okay to go. By the way, cannot contain. <laughs> In what way? The sexual activity. What's the whole issue here? Avoiding fornication. If you can't contain, then don't go run around out there. Go get married. It's fine. Again, but I, I, if, you, if this is a supernatural imposed gift by God, then you would never have an urge to do that. You would have the urge to stay celibate. But obviously you don't. You still have that urge there. So if you can't contain, marry. Now what happens here is they use this passage here to say that God is anti-marriage. I mean, Paul is anti-marriage. And that is really not the case at all. If you go back up to verse 9, but if they cannot contain, let them what? Mary, verse 15, but if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. Isn't that interesting? Not under bondage. Hmm. That's a little different than what the law says. Law says that the husband and wife are bound till one of them dies. Paul says if the unbeliever leaves, you're good to go. You can go get married, remarried. Verse 28. But and if thou marry, okay, well, who, who are we talking about? Verse 27, 
Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loose. Art thou loose from a wife? Seek not a wife. There's the issue of divorce. It happens. So don't go run out there and don't, don't seek it. That, and by the way, in verse 27, the point is the seek word. But verse 28, but and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. See, marriage, he's not anti-marriage at all. By the way, verse 39, the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will only in the Lord. See, he's not against marriage. 1 Timothy 3. You, you, you know, you think about this stuff. 1 Timothy 3, in the qualifications that he gives here of those that desire the office of a bishop and, and the office of the deacon, he says, verse 2, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. In that husband of one. Right now in time, he has what? One wife. Nothing about divorce or remarriage. Right in the moment, you have one wife. So then what's, what does he, what does he abdicate? Marriage. If you look down at verse, uh, uh, da, 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 da. verse 10, talking about the deacons. I love verse 8. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine. <laughs> not greedy of much wine. You can have a little because you've got to deal with the preacher. <laughs> the preacher can't have any, but you, gotta, you can have a little to get, deal with him. Anyway, even so, uh, verse 10, and, and let these also first be uh, proved, and then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so must their wives be. Verse 12, let the deacons be the husband of one wife. Again, it's not about being divorced and all that. It's about presently in the moment, one. So you, we, and you can go to Titus 1, again, the, the parameters. The point is, is in 1 Corinthians 7, he's not saying I'm against marriage. I'm all for marriage. But if the situation that you find yourself in is a situation that you need to have, you, you need to understand you have options. You take the doctrines learned about marriage and, 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 and its purpose, its, its covenant, its agreement, its, its makeup, and then you apply that to the details of your life, you have options. You look at what's going on in life, and when you find yourself unmarried, you assess the situation, and then you make a decision of your own will to either remain unmarried or to go get married. It's okay. Either way is good to go. That's the whole point in 6, 7, 8, and 9. The point here is not to say that Paul was a married man and as soon as he left the Jews' religion, his wife took off because he lost his black card and couldn't go shopping at Neiman Marcus's. You giggled, I've heard that from a very serious man, preacher. No, that's not, Paul didn't say that. Paul just says, I find myself unmarried, I'm going to stay unmarried, I'm going to stay celibate. Why? Look at my life, look at my ministry. I can't go do what I need to go do as the apostle of the Gentiles. I can't go do that. Now, again, at the same token, Paul's not saying you've got to have a lone, live a lonely life. He doesn't say that at all. Why? If you can't contain, it's better to go what? Go get married, verse 9, than to burn. And again, the burning there is the burning of the lust of the fornication. Okay? And the burning issue there. So Paul is demonstrating here the way to think about things of life graciously. And the way that there are viable options when there are areas that, you can, that the Lord allows you to make a decision in. When he says, don't do that, this is the... When he says, verse 10, And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord... Okay, so this is going to be the, the doctrine. Let not the wife depart from her husband. That is divorce. Don't you divorce. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. Now, we'll get into all of that, okay? But what is the doctrine? Divorce is not an option. It's not the first option. But does divorce happen? Yes, it does. 
That's verse 12. There, what is the command of the Lord? You're married, you're married till death do you part. But there, and we'll look at divorce uh, actually in Scripture because there's Moses with the bill of divorcement. By the way, God divorces Israel, puts her away. Paul, the earthly ministry of the Lord, he talks about divorce. Paul then comes over and talks about divorce in a completely different light than all of that. And again, Paul's thing here is, hey, you've got options. Here's the detail. By, by the way, we got a couple minutes. What is the, what's the rule, verse 10? No divorce, right? But look at verse 14. For the unbelieving husband, uh, well, uh, verse 12, verse 12. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, verse 13, and the woman which hath a husband that believeth not. Now, it, would that be a sticky issue if it's death do you part and he's telling the wife to get out? That'd be pretty sticky. Because what's the rule? Don't do it. But you see how Paul comes in and says, okay, we've got the doctrine, and we'll look in all the detail. But we got this doctrine. Doctrine's learned. But here's what life did to us. So now we have an option. To the rest speak I. Not the Lord. So grace isn't, condoning the divorce, grace is acknowledging divorce happens, and here's some options for those involved in it that can carry out. That's why verse 28 says to the divorcee, or the divorced, but in if in thou marry, thou hast not sinned. Why? You didn't seek it. And that's why seeking in verse 27 is so critical. Okay, so when you, we'll pick up in verse 10, it's time to quit now. So just, I want, I, I want you to understand that Paul is saying, look guys, in, in, in the dispensation of grace, in the doctrines learned, you have viable options. It isn't that you don't have the, rule, the, the, the doctrine, but you understand that and then you turn to life and say, okay, I can rightfully, the right use of this doctrine, apply it this way or this way or this. I can do that and I'm good to go. Okay? Because that's literally what the, how he's going to deal with from verse 10 all the way down through chapter 16. Here's the deal. Here's the corrective doctrine to the Corinthians, and here's the right application of it. If you don't have this, you can't rightly apply it, can you? you got to get that. Okay? All right. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word, for the instructions in it, for the guidelines. But we also thank you for your grace and the ability that you have given us to make decisions for ourselves in our own situations in the moment and that those situations are, are right, are well, are good. For your honor and for your glory, in your name we pray, amen.